another average of 25. So that's going to be zero, and that's why it gets back in your hand. So notice that these numbers are the same as that. That's how I knew that if it took three seconds to get to its highest point, it would take another three to get back down to the ground. The, the accelerations are exactly the same. Ten on its way up and ten on its way down. It's just on its way up, it's slowing down, and on the way down, it's speeding up. But the numbers come out to be exactly the same. So, like I said, this is probably the, the, the hardest one of it. Well, it's probably a good time for me now to just say, okay, we're done with this chapter. We've described motion, we've talked a lot, I've showed you some really, really good examples, and hopefully a lot of that has sunken in. But it's your turn now to do the lab and the homework from this one. And uh, this will be your second homework assignment. And I need to look on that Canvas one and give you an option to start turning things in if you, uh, if you want. Uh, but I'll say it again here. The goal is, uh, as I'm learning how to do Canvas and you're learning how to do Canvas, is let's just work on these problems and everything's going to be due June 1. Okay? But let's keep talking because if I pick up the uh, syllabus here, and I'll just to turn on the computer, kind of hold up the hard copy of the uh, syllabus that I sent you. Uh, this is our second day, Tuesday, and you'll, say, you'll see today's goal is to finish chapter two, okay, so we just did that, and to get started into chapter three. And so we're about a half hour into this second uh, lecture for today, and so we'll do another 45 minutes on chapter three. That won't finish it up and then you'll see on Wednesday our goal is to finish three and to, to start four. And so that'll be tomorrow's videotape and uh, uh, lecture. All right, so I'm going to turn the page and I will wait for any uh, questions that you might have. In fact, maybe I'll make a little mental note. This, this morning um, when I logged in, I looked and it seemed like uh, the questions I got weren't related they were good questions, don't get me wrong. You guys sent me questions more about getting registered and uh, using Canvas and uh, just the structure of the class, and that's all good. Uh, but that also told me nobody was asking about any difficulties they had in, in Chapter 1, and that's kind of normal. Uh, but let me say it again. You might have a little more difficulties here now that we went to our first chapter on, on, on physics. And so if you have any, any problem, shoot me an email. Tomorrow morning I'll log on and I'll look at them. And uh, when I start the videotape, I'll, I'll, I'll do those. Uh, de depending, or I'll make a separate videotape and, and put them on that Google Doc that I still have to make. Uh, kind of waiting for a question to make the Google Doc of where you guys can see all your, all your questions there. But uh, again, don't hesitate to uh, send any questions or uh, those tutors, I guess, were, were also the, the options. And I need, just reminded myself, I need to send you that information on our, our local uh, tutors. All right, well, give me a second here to kind of wipe the board clean and say, let's move into the next chapter. Because chapter three uh, is an extension or continues on with what we've been doing. Uh, you might remember when I started this chapter, I said that this chapter could be best uh, written as, and, and it was, that's the title of it, Describing Motion. So I did not say why the falling object has an acceleration of 10. I just said it does. And we did an experiment in the lab um, or I guess I did it and you watched it or you were, you know, we were partners together. But in no way at this point have I tried to explain why that acceleration is 10. And just like this incline we did, I put it on here and I told you that it had something to do with the slope of the hill, but I really didn't explain it. And that's where this chapter wants to continue on here. And so I would then say that a good way to label chapter 3 is by its title and its title says explaining the motion. And so why do these objects have their these acceleration? You know why does something in free fall have 10? 
And of course, that's on planet Earth. It's not the same on the moon or any of the other planets. And so, so why? What, what makes that acceleration? And so why is it different on the different planets? And of course, if we have air friction, that changes it too. Or if we have a rocket engine, that changes it too. Or if we have a parachute, that changes it too. So how much does it change it by? Why does it change? What is really affecting it? So our next step into understanding the physics here is explaining the motion. And I am going to assume, but just in case you haven't, I'm going to put a very famous scientist <laughs> uh, on the board here. It's called Newton. And Newton looked at the motion and he looked at a lot of different motions, everything from a horse and carriage to the planets uh, orbiting around in our solar system. And he noticed a pattern to all motion. And so here's the good news. Here. It doesn't matter what we talk about. We could talk about things that weren't even around in Newton's time, like uh, a rocket ship. But the motion of a rocket ship, as well as the motion of the planets, as well as the motion of a horse and a carriage, and the motion of an arrow. And so Newton did a lot of studying the motion of an arrow, and studying the motion of a horse and carriage, and studying the motion of the planets. But we could do it with cars that didn't even exist in Newton's day. We could do it with uh, projectiles, say a, a rifle and a bullet didn't exist. But, or, no, you know what? Well, that got my curiosity. When was gunpowder and bullets exist? I, I don't think I don't, I don't think they had them in Newton's day. Cannon. Oh yeah, cannons would have been good. 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 Good point. Uh, yeah, cannons. Okay, they, they definitely had cannons, but they didn't have individual rifles. Anyways, it, the, my point is hopefully still the same. That here's our goal. What are Newton's three laws of motion? And then how do we use them? Because what I hope to get across to you then is all motion can be explained with these three laws. And so whether we're talking about a satellite, whether we're talking about the planets, whether we're talking about uh, SpaceX and launching a rocket, or whatever, we can explain all the motion with Newton's three laws. So this is very powerful. Uh, I like to say this. Physics is about knowing how to apply a few but very powerful ideas to explain a universe of phenomena. And so one of the things that gets me really excited about uh, physics, and I hope it does you too, is there's not a whole lot of memorization and there's not a whole lot of principles to keep track of. All motion. I, I don't care what this is. As I said, we could talk about a horse and carriage, or we could talk about a cannonball, or we could talk about a missile. All of this motion can be explained with these three laws. And so as long as I know those three laws, I can explain any, any motion. And that's the beauty of physics and the beauty of the, of the science here. So what are these three laws? And obviously, there is three of them. So let's start with the first law. And um, my hope here is that we can kind of talk about the first two and then we'll probably need to call it uh, quits and then we'll pick up the rest uh, tomorrow here. But Newton's first law, and I'll just put the words on the board first, it says that the velocity of an object remains constant unless, now let, let me just pause right there, because tying this in with the chapter we just got done, it says the velocity remains constant. Now if the velocity remains constant, what would be the acceleration? Yeah, and I'm just imagining a you guys face to face, somebody's going to say, well, doesn't that mean the acceleration is zero? Yes, because the acceleration is the change in the velocity. 
And so what we're really saying here is an object would have no acceleration. Its acceleration would be zero. The velocity would remain constant. Or to put another way, the acceleration would be zero. There would be no change to the velocity. Unless, okay, so what we're saying here is that there are cases where you will have no change in velocity, but there's also cases where you will have a change. And so the unless is telling us, well, when would we have our changes in our velocity? When would we have an acceleration? And your author likes to write it this way. It would be a constant unless an unbalanced force acts on the object. Sometimes, instead of calling it the first law, so we don't have just numbers, we like to call this the law of inertia. And inertia is a fancy word that I, I'll need to explain here. You may not be familiar with that big word. But I just want to talk about this. And part of this unless is this idea of a force. And so in our conversation here, you're going to see forces show up. Let me just call force for the moment a push or a pull. Something that interacts with an object, something that wants to make it move, something that you can push or something you can pull. And so my hand could reach out to this table and pull it or push it. And I would say I'm applying a force. My, my foot could do the, the same thing. I could tie a rope. I could put magnets. Uh, I could, uh, you know, uh, let gravity pull it down. There's a lot of ways this thing could be pushed or, or, or pulled. And so this is a very open-ended idea. Anything that's a push or a pull. But what would they mean by unbalanced force is, is this. What if I were to take this cart... And I'll kind of maybe center this cart here in the, in the middle. And in fact, maybe I'll move some of these items that I already used over to here so I can get some other items out, assuming we get that far. I'll just tuck these underneath. Okay. And... So if I take this, this object, so this will be my, my, my table here, here's my, my object, and let's just say that I push it in one direction. So I'll represent that with a little, little arrowhead. So, I, so I'm going I'm to push it this way. But what we mean by balanced is what if there's a second force? pushing exactly the same way, but in the opposite direction. So in other words, you might say, okay, I'm pushing this way, and somebody else is pushing this way. And they're pushing exactly the same amount. Now, right here, this is that new quantity. Remember that big table we were making? And I don't have one up here for, for this chapter. And let me not take the time to put it up here. But I would say I'm trying to introduce you to a new quantity. We're going to call it force. And force then needs to be measured in some kind of units. And we will measure it in newtons. Uh, that's in honor of Newton and Newton's three laws of motion. And so there's our or push. And so let me just say that I am pushing over this way to the west and my friend over here, or maybe I should say partner because my friend is getting in my way really, is pushing this way and they're each pushing with three. Now we like to abbreviate this with a capital N so I'll say three newtons and three newtons. But I would say this is a balanced force. And you could even imagine, even before we started this class, that if 
we were each on opposite sides pushing the same amount, what do you think would happen to this object? <laughs> yeah, it would just stay there. And that's exactly what Newton's first law is saying here, right? It is saying the velocity of an object remains constant. In this case, the velocity is zero. And it would only change from zero if there's an unbalanced force. And so I'm trying to say if there is a balanced force, then it remains with that same constant velocity, that is zero. And so if I'm pushing this way and my friend is pushing this way, we're pushing against each other, we're each pushing with three, but we have balanced force. And so as long as it's balanced, nothing really happens. It just keeps its same speed. And likewise, what if I didn't push at all? And so I'll change this. Zero newtons. And my friend is pushing with zero newtons. Again, I would say that's balanced. You, you might even say, well, there's no forces. Okay, but no forces are still uh, uh, balanced. But as long as they're balanced, and we're going to start using the phrase net force here. And so you put the two forces together, you see the result. And one going left and one going right, if they're the same magnitude, they cancel each other off. And that's what Newton's first law is saying. So Newton's first law doesn't really have an equation here. It's a concept, but it's an important one. It is simply saying whether it will or will not have an acceleration. It doesn't tell you how much the acceleration is. That's what the second law is going to do. And so the first and the second, to me, go together. The first one just tells us, is there or is there not going to be an acceleration? Or maybe the other way around, if there is an acceleration, then there is a net force. There is an unbalanced force. And so both of these scenarios would represent a balanced force. And so both of these would represent no change in the velocity. So in this case, the object has zero. But I want to emphasize that it doesn't say the velocity has to be zero when you have a balanced force. It says if you're having a balanced force, the velocity has to remain constant. That's crucial. And so I have four quick experiments that I think make this sink in a little bit better. The first two involve zero speed. Uh, watch, come, on, come over to here with me. Um, I, I've set up um, a dish here, a plate, and a glass. And they are just sitting here, and I would say they are at rest. They have a speed of zero. And Newton's first law is saying they want to remain that way. That's really what it's saying. Now, they don't have to. That's why it has the unless. It can change if there's some unbalanced forces. So if somebody comes over here and grabs this plate and throws it across like a frisbee, it will gain speed. But if no forces, or better still, you have a balanced set of forces. It is at rest and it wants to remain there. So what makes this kind of a fun experiment to illustrate Newton's first law here is underneath this plate and this glass is I have some butcher paper. And the butcher paper is pretty smooth. And so as I pull on it, there is a little rubbing. Now, not much rubbing. But there is a little bit of rubbing. I'm going to say it's so little rubbing, it's like no force at all. No, watch, let me see if I can show you a difference here. Um, if I grab this piece of wood under here, and I give this thing a push, uh, you'll see that as it moves across the table, it goes slower and slower and slower and slower. It is definitely changing its speed. And if we look at this first law, it says here that the velocity will change if there's an unbalanced force. Now, if I had pushed it across the table and somebody else put their hand and stopped it, you would have said, well, yeah, I see the force. Somebody's hand reached out and stopped it. Okay. 
but is there any force as it slides across the table? And there is. There is the rubbing of the molecules on the table down here and the molecules on this wood. And so an object like this actually does have a force on it. And therefore this says, because there is an unbalanced force, there will be a change in its velocity. And so in this case it slows down. Now I say all that because if you come back here, here's what makes this trick kind of fun, is there is some rubbing between the plate and the glass, but the smooth butcher paper makes that pretty small. And if it's so small, I could call it zero or negligible, then I would say there is no force or it's all balanced and therefore it would remain with the same speed. And so here's the question. Can I pull this piece of butcher paper out from underneath them without these plates going flying all over the place? And the real key was, yeah, it's got to be smooth. I also got to do it kind of quickly. And so I will illustrate what we call Newton's first law by saying, let me take my little experiment here on the count of three. Actually, am I hanging over the edge there? Okay. So on the count of three, maybe I'll put a little closer. Can the video camera see that? So on the count of three, I'll pull it off the end and hopefully it will illustrate Newton's first law. The force will be so small I can neglect it. And its speed is zero, so after I pull it out, its speed is still zero. Okay, one, two, three, go. Yay! And I, I can hear you guys at home now clapping. Yeah, it worked here. So, see here what we call the law of inertia. In fact, this will give me a chance to point out this big fancy word. Inertia is just a big fancy word that means resist change. And so, hey, these resist change. They were at rest, they want to remain at rest. And so the law of inertia is just saying things that are at rest want to remain that way. Do they have to stay that way? No, they don't have to. That's why it says unless. But in order to make them start to move, you got to give them a force. That's what this is saying. Uh, well, I'll show you another one, the same thing. Uh, that's what this uh, crazy one is for. It kind of makes a, a fun uh, in-class experiment when we uh, do uh, some betting with the, the students here. And I like to say, say this. If I take this metal rod, which you can see has a string that is tied to this weight, and then this string is tied up here, and it comes loose a lot, so let me make sure, sure it's good and tight. But if I pull on this metal rod, and I should point out these strings came off the same spool, so they're the same quality of string. Would the string at the top or the bottom break? Now in an in-class one, I usually take a vote. And I said, who thinks the bottom one is going to break and who thinks the top is? Um, obviously, we don't have an in-class one here this time, so I can't really take a vote. But usually, uh, the class as a whole says the top one will break. And usually, they tell me later that, well, it's because if you pull the bottom one, it's this top string that has to support not just your pull, but also this extra weight here. Whereas the bottom string just has to support the pole. And so this one is under what you might say more tension and therefore breaks. And I say, okay, so let's give it a try. And so most of you think this one is going to break. And so then I take it and I pull it quickly. And the bottom one breaks. But watch this, same setup. Same string. And if I ask again which one breaks, well, again, most of the class goes, well, the bottom one, I just saw it. But watch this. I'm going to pull it, not quickly. I'm just going to pull it more. Let me make sure this is tight. So I'm going to pull it more, more, more. And then the top one breaks. 
And so it matters how I pull it. And again, this is a good illustration of the law of inertia. And the part that it breaks at the top because there's more tension, as most of the students were thinking at the beginning, is true. The top string does have to support my pull and the weight of this object, but only if I give it enough time to react. That is, the inertia is there. This will move, but not right away. This will want to stay there. And so as I yank on the bottom one real quick, that mass just stays there and it doesn't transmit that tension to the top one. And the tension in the bottom one is so much more that it breaks right away. And so that's why the bottom one broke when I first pulled it. And that's why the top one broke when I pulled it more and more and more and more. Then it really did have more tension in the top than the bottom one. Because then the top one really did have to support not only my pull, but also the, the weight. I, I, I gave it a time to uh, react. In fact, this is probably no different than you've done this at home. I, I end up doing this a lot. I have kind of this narrow little small kitchen and on this side I have a microwave and uh, over here uh, I, I have my paper towel roll. And so it's pretty common for me to, you know, put a piece of chicken on a plate, put it in the microwave and set it on and in 30 seconds I have a hot piece of chicken. And so I'll reach into the microwave with my left hand and I have a hot piece of chicken that I don't want to put down but I want a paper towel because the chicken I'm going to eat with my fingers and it's all greasy. And so how do I get that one sheet off of that paper towel roll when I only have my right hand? And so here's what I'll do. I'll grab it and pull it slowly and that lets it unwind and then when I get that whole sheet out there then I'll pull it quickly I'll even pull it down at an angle so it goes along the perforations but as I pull it quickly I'm taking advantage of this law of inertia I know this big roll and just like that string it won't unwind until it has a time to react to my pole, but my pole is so quickly that it tears. And so I get that sheet of, uh, of uh, uh, paper towel <laughs> and, and, and my chicken and I have each one in my hand and now I can go over to the table and sit down and, and eat my chicken. And so I take advantage of that. And there's always this time near the end of the paper roll where I get down and there's only like five or six more sheets on there. And because of that, they doesn't have much inertia. There's not much to that roll. And so I pull the one off and I go to pull it quick and all five of them just come rolling off. And so I don't have that inertia. I don't have that resistance. And so you can really see that first law in your kitchen. Well, let me show you more about them because I think a little bit harder to comprehend is not the ones that are at rest and want to stay there. Again, let me point out, notice this does not say the velocity is zero. This just says a constant velocity. So this would mean something that is already moving would continue to move with that same velocity. Now remember the last chapter, velocity is both magnitude and direction. So the same speed and the same direction unless acted upon by a force. And so you saw me do this earlier and I'll do it again if I push this. When it first comes out of my hand it has a speed let's just say about three meters per second and then it goes slower, 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 slower. It definitely is changing its, its speed. And I said that it is changing its speed, therefore it's changing its velocity because there is a force and that force is the, the friction. And so what if I had no friction? And that might be best done with these little toys. These little toys have a built-in fan and they blow air out the bottom. And so they kind of hover. Maybe you can kind of see it just lift off the table a little bit. And one of these has a little stronger batteries. Yeah, I think this one's a little stronger. And it just kind of hovers there. But if you watch this, if I give this a little push, it'll keep going in the same direction. 
until there's a force on it. And so there it goes. And the, no, no, half fell off. But I want to emphasize that the first law here is saying you don't need a force to keep it going. What does a force do? A force gives it an acceleration. If it is already going, a balanced force just leaves it alone. And this is a little bit like your car. I've, you've probably noticed, maybe when you're getting on the freeway, as you start to accelerate, you've got to push hard on the gas. And that is a net force. Uh, that is an unbalanced force. And your car goes faster and faster and faster and faster. But when you get up to, say, 70 miles an hour, you might ease up on the gas. Pull your foot back. Now, you never take your foot completely off the gas. Because remember, you're hitting the air molecules, so there's rubbing going on. And let's just say the rubbing is 100 newtons. So you need your foot on the gas to give you 100 newtons to get a balanced force. And so you don't need as much force as it required for you to start accelerating. To start accelerating, you had to put the pedal down more. You had to get, you know, if you had air friction of 100 this way, then you had to have something more than a hundred. And that's what this is saying. To get an acceleration, you have to have an unbalanced force. You have to have the force pushing you this way more than the force pushing you that way. But to keep going, they just have to be balanced. And so you can kind of cruise along with not much use of gasoline. And that's why your car will always get better mileage, uh, miles per gallon, when you're on the freeway going constant speeds than when you're in city traffic, stop, go, stop, go, stop, go. Because you got to accelerate it. And you have to have an unbalanced force in order to get it to accelerate. Uh, I've got another fun one to do. It's really kind of the same thing, but I'll just kind of uh, throw it in here. But I've got this cart. And I don't know if this can even be picked up on the uh, video camera. But this cart does have wheels. And these wheels have really, really good ball bearings. And so you spin them and they just keep spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning and spinning. They're not perfect, but they're really good. And they really let this illustrate really well, because if I give this thing a little push, it'll just keep going at the same speed all the way across. There is no friction. And because there's no force, there's no acceleration, or there is a, a constant speed. All right, well, that's Newton's first law. Let's talk about Newton's second law. And like I said, I think that's about as far as we could and should get for today. And as I mentioned earlier, the second law really is an extension of the first law. I like to say this, the first law gives me a way to look at a problem and say whether there is or is not an acceleration. The second law then gives me a formula to calculate that acceleration. So the second law says the acceleration is... And there's two factors. Uh, the first one is the force. And it's really what we're going to call the net force. Uh, let me try to make that clear. But for right now, let me just say the force. Then divided by its mass. And so you'll see after tomorrow's lecture and you have to do the homework over the weekend that you'll be asked to do this equation a lot. You'll, you'll start the problem kind of thinking about the first law, saying, is there or is there not an acceleration? Once you realize there is or isn't, and of course there isn't, you could just say, oh, the acceleration is zero, and you're kind of done there. But if you realize there is an acceleration, now the next step is to calculate what that acceleration is. And this was Newton's great discovery that what makes something accelerate is 
two factors, not just one. Well, let's see if I can illustrate. So I grab this track here, and uh, I'll use this cart. Uh, I'll grab some mass bars here. But this cart has a little plunger on it. And this plunger can go in a little bit right there and be released. Or it can go in what I'll call a medium amount and be released. Or it can go in a large amount and be released. And each of those plunger goes in a little bit further. I think you could imagine, even from the home or even if you were in the classroom, that this would correspond to a small force when I barely pushed it in, a medium force when I pushed it halfway in, and a big force when I pushed it all the way in. And so if I put it just a small distance up against this plunger, watch what happens and tell me if you can't see both the first and the second law into play. Uh, that is, if I release it, and I'm hoping what you see is during the small distance when the plunger is pushing on the cart, I would say there is an unbalanced force. I would say there is an acceleration. And according to the first law, it says, okay, during that time frame, if you have an unbalanced force, then you must get an acceleration. And what I'm trying to show you here is then the second law would allow me to calculate that. Oh, for the sake of argument, let's just say that when I push it in just a short distance, that gives me a small force.